talk on uh, source to sink, um, especially in the study case of the Chechen Lagoon um, and the border. And so I, <coughs> and this I, I need to spoil because uh, the title is actually uh, artificial intelligence. So I asked, you know, what is the Chechen's title? And then I gave some parameters and it came up with rivers in harmony, oceans uh, symphony, or you could put it uh, oceans in empathy, right? Because this is what Eva was kind of telling, that everything that goes into the watershed is actually ending up in, in the sea, right? And this is happening since the existence of planet Earth. Um, so every, every kind of high mountains soon, as a geologist, will kind of travel down and eventually end up in the, in the sea. Okay. <coughs> um, right, and today I'm um, here as, uh, as a private lecturer at the University of Greifswald because I returned back after a long journey through uh, Canada and German universities and uh, eventually the family asked, you know, where, where was really the place to be? And then we uh, moved back up to, um, to Schreisen, close to Greifswald. And uh, that's why I'm in currently, uh, not so much at the university, but I'm also uh, head of the, uh, <coughs> uh, of the WWF um, uh, office of the Baltic Sea. So I'm kind of taking my focus now on, on my own backyard in the Baltic Sea. I kind of pinched your kind of um, layout from uh, from the, the pamphlet of the uh, River University. I think it's very nice. Um, and this will be the call through. Um, so I give a first introduction about river, uh, river sediments and then with special focus on heavy metals nutrients and then how this may apply to uh, the setting we have here. So, we have seen this slide, more or less, in Robert's talk, uh, and I'm very grateful that I um, don't need to repeat everything, but, um, so we, we have all these kind of different uh, river systems, but as a geologist or geoscientist, we kind of focus on the dynamic, right, on the time scale, and then you can see that the sediment is deposited, remobilized, deposited, um, and so it's a kind of a whole uh, array of what is happening. And then as you have erosional parts and then you have depositional parts, and this is kind of, would you take a, a core from here, you would have an interpolated you know, um, um, structure or um, from different times and different settings of, of the river. So the point is you have a lateral migration, so you have erosional processes, but also depositional processes. So this is kind of natural. Um, but also pointed here, and also on the next slide, you have to have a certain velocity in the river to move certain uh, rain sizes, right? And then there are some, some kind of um, calculations and they also explain when ripples are formed when larger uh, bed forms are kind of uh, possible. But then um, you also have differences in kind of how the particles actually move. So sometimes they just are rolling uh, or sliding and then in, especially in floods, once they are kind of mobilized, they kind of get into suspension and then they can easily kind of rush um, towards the sea. And one point really worth remembering is, if this particle is moving towards the sea, it's moving towards the sea, it will never come back. Right? And this is important when you understand when there is a structure in the water deepening the riverbed, this sediment is gone for good, right? It's, it's at the sea, right? So the sea wins. Um, 
And this is a fundamental uh, problem, I think, for, uh, for the future. Anyway, <coughs> so this, uh, in, in the preparation of the talk, I also came across this um, rational model. And I think this is worth mentioning because it is already taking the, say, the soil erodibility into account. So where it is kind of possible to, uh, to erode, and also by the rainfall, where will the erosion kind of um, going to happen? And then you have the, the cover management, and so this is kind of going into the direction of what Helen just um, took us. Slope lengths, uh, steepness, etc. And then what kind of practices are, um, may support or hinder the erosion? And we haven't talked about the elephant in the room, and I think this is agricultural and subsidies for the agriculture um, that is going to happen at the moment. Okay, so I think it's worth kind of looking in, in, uh, in a quiet moment uh, at this model. So we learned that certain grain sizes move us or needs to have a certain velocity of the, of the river. And this is true, which is kind of more or less a, a mathematical function. But then you have clay, right? And clay is when, when you study geology, you normally have one uh, professor only dealing with clay. And <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. <laughs> and when I was a student, I was always wondering, oh, you know, is that really necessary? But yes, because clay is behaving differently in all kinds of aspects. Um, sometimes it's only minerals. Um, clay can kind of also uh, change in, in volume, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, cool stuff. And in the, in the context of rivers, if you have clay in the river, you may have a surface that is kind of, even though you're talking about two micrometers um, clay particles, they are not moved even though you have a high velocity, because they are kind of almost kind of a concrete uh, surface, right? So you need to have kind of bumps into it that they are eventually kind of uh, mobilized again. Um, and here's an, an, another point, um, and that is how to kind of uh, keep the sediment blocked. Right? And this is that you enter huge amounts of clay and then you kind of demobilize the surface. And this is sometimes necessary if you think about uh, hazardous uh, substances and you don't want to get them remobilized. Um, putting clay into the system is one option um, to kind of stabilize the surface. Clay is also because of its, um, its kind of structure of certain clay minerals and um, that they are also to, to bind um, heavy metals or other hazardous uh, substances. So this is on one side, it's on purpose, you can take it to kind of demobilize um, the pollutants. But on the other side, once they stick to, to the clay, they stick to the clay. So once you remobilize the clay, you remobilize also the heavy metals and the, the pollutants stick to it. And this is more or less um, also given in, in this diagram uh, about heavy metals, um, that you have the, the phase where it's kind of dissolved in, in the water, and in the river you would kind of transport it to the sea. Slower, faster, but eventually it will end up in, in the sea uh, when it's still diluted in the water. But then, the, the heavy metal may stick to, to the surface and this may be clay. Um, and once they stick, there are certain uh, environmental parameters where they can also kind of release the, the uh, heavy metals also. And sometimes it depends on the oxygen uh, and um, kind of other properties and then they kind of release back into the water and again move towards the sea. Okay, a little bit of limnology also, um, because we want to deal about uh, nutrients, but we don't want to get into much uh, de de 
So this is phosphorus, carbon, and nitrogen as um, the main components we want to focus. So POP uh, here in this case is a particle um, um, uh, organic uh, phosphorus. And then you have the dissolved, and then you have the reactive uh, phosphorus part also dissolved. And this is where the algae will turn up and eat it as as a nutrient. And here, um, then as a carbon, is also these kind of two dimensions. So you have the dissolved and the particulated um, phase of the carbon. And the same is true for nitrogen, and then you have the nitrification, and this is uh, changing when you have anoxia conditions, which is happening mostly in, in stagnant waters, right? Um, and then connected to this is also remobilization of, of nutrients from the sediment again. What is known is also simulated in models, and uh, I like models very much um, when they kind of reflect what is happening in the nature. Um, and here is basically just that nitrogen on phosphorus as they're going up, also the, um, the chlorophyll content is also the concentration is going up. Of course, algae bloom is going to happen. And this is uh, apparently um, a little bit more complicated. But anyway, um, the residual ratio worth mentioning because we have a ratio of about 16 um, um, parts of nitrogen and one part of phosphorus. And as soon as you are in this ratio, you get the optimum for the algae to bloom. Yeah? It shoots up. And then, as you know from, I think Liebig was it, also from the agriculture, um, um, yes, from the agricultural kind of farmland, he um, also made the point when you have one element in kind of not the optimum, the plant grows or the algae bloom will kind of be tempted, it will be kind of not, it will be suppressed. Right? So the point is when you have hundreds of parts of nitrogen and only one part of phosphorus, it will not further depend on the nitrogen, it will only depend on the phosphorus part. So if you don't increase in the phosphorus, the algae bloom will just go as it will go if it would be 16. Right? So any pollution into nitrogen will not have the effect. So this is why in many cases, uh, especially in lakes, you see that the nitrogen is kind of skyrocketing because of the agricultural uh, farmland in the surroundings. But as soon as you kind of lower the phosphorus, the algae bloom will also decrease. And so, and then the question arises: How do you fix the, the phosphorus for good? But uh, that's another story. And, um, and and then, of course, nature happens. And nature is very um, good in, in fantasy. And this is cyanobacteria. They can kind of grab the nitrogen from the atmosphere. So, if there is limitation in nitrogen they just take it from the atmosphere. And then they kind of uh, produce it, right? And once they decay, they die and decay into the sediment, so more nitrogen from the atmosphere is eventually uh, fixed in the sediment. So you don't need any harm then if you actually just need tiny bacteria fix uh, the nitrogen from the atmosphere and get it into the system. Okay, this is another point. Um, to for for the um, slides to come, and then I just have one slide on, on climate because I know there's a, a, a whole lecture on it. Um, but for for our reason uh, for our region here, um, Helcom was um, setting this up. So you have a seasonal runoff uh, that will change, and then the extremes um, will. And of also happen the floods are projected to decrease in the north, um, but then of course in our part here in the south, it will actually increase due to 
to um, higher precipitation. And then the mean change is that you have some kind of increase of what is uh, from today to 22%. So this means more potential erosion is coming up. Okay, now let's dive into the case study of the Chechen Lagoon. You have seen this um, picture here uh, in a different um, uh, kind of uh, setting. And here, geology, yeah, right? I was for too long time with geologists, so I had to explain what's, what was happening here. Um, so you have the inland ice sheet still covering the Baltic Sea. And this is uh, in this part here. So here, you, the black outline is a recent outline, the coastline um, with the island Berlin and Usedom, and we are somewhere here, I guess. So the Oder River developed over time, right? Because sea level was um, 20 to 30 meters below. So it was taking its place, and when you look at the bathymetry in the uh, Pomeranian Bay, you can still see the older uh, river uh, bed from former times. And then sea level rose and eventually you had probably something that goes into a delta and not a lagoon. Um, and then as the sea level rose, these kind of island cores were connected by, by sand and so it was happening uh, Usedom and also Berlin and close kind of the lagoon of the And this is just to demonstrate as an elevation model that when the, the inland ice sheet was here, all the kind of melt water was passed in this way. And for a long time, it was actually uh, draining into the North Sea. Okay. And then this is a bathymetry um, exaggregated. And here you see this line. And this is uh, artificial shipping line. It kind of, there's another um, expression. So this is kind of to, to make the, um, the large shipping going through the lagoon because it's uh, kind of an average kind of 3.5 meters. And this is um, what we will see uh, eventually uh, also a great sink uh, for heavy metals. And just to for you to uh, understand what, um, what kind of inflow of the order is kind of what, on what kind of consequences is happening. Here it is only um, temperature, but here you already see that it's kind of uh, high temperature here, and you can see that there's a plume, a constant plume that is kind of moving towards the, the Baltic Sea. And then the whole system in the Baltic Sea, as we don't have any tides, uh, it's more or less wind driven, and you can see that it's kind of distributing from there. And temperature is one point, but you, if you take any, any kind of particle, this will go a similar way on the surface of the Baltic Sea. And here is also something for Aaron to kind of maybe pick up when you return home. Um, so there is a historical development of nutrients. It was better in the past, yes, but it was even worse in the past, and now it's better. And this is also true, at least in some um, uh, in some parts, for the nutrients. And there's a Chernetsky, he also kind of modeled and uh, thought, okay, what, what was going to happen? And here, he's concentrating only on, on phosphorus and here on, on nitrogen emissions. So green is good, red is bad, and um, the order river is, and well, this is the whole catchment, and then here we have the Baltic Sea. This is in the 1960s, 1985, and this is 2000. And we know from the Baltic Sea that we have this huge nutrient peak in the 80s, late 80s, and then it's actually decreasing. And this is what is also mirrored here in the, in the catchment of, uh, of the order. And this is true for phosphorus and nitrogen. The point Chernesky makes is that you have the red field um, ratio here, and in the 60s, 
you had also an increase, and this is kind of not really natural, but it's uh, probably something we hope to be there uh, in 2027, when the water framework directive is um, again ending. And um, what you can see is that the red field ratio was below for more than half a year. So the algae bloom were actually kind of not happening because there was simply not uh, the right ratio. And this is controlled by nitrogen. And this is true for, for the Tuchin lagoon, but also um, the Baltic Sea um, outlet. And then eventually in the, in the 80s, you see that you only have a certain part uh, in summer where you have kind of, you are below the, the ratio, and this is because it was massive in, in the production, and the algae bloom was um, eating away all the nutrients and only the cyanobacteria were taking place. Okay, and then we have floods, and uh, in 1997, we had this extreme event, and extreme events is also when the nutrients were kind of flowing into um, the Baltic Sea as the catchment um, was kind of drained and eroded with uh, all the nutrients. And here you can see that the volume of the Eastern Lagoon, which is 1.56 uh, cubic kilometers, were kind of entering in eight days or even in six days. So it was a rapid return or, or turnover of the whole lagoon, of the whole uh, water. And here also, um, just to give you an impression that the nitrate transport was kind of also uh, by, an, uh, by, uh, by an order of 10 uh, um, magnified. And also accumulating, entering the Baltic Sea. Thank you very much. Okay, um, but here is also from Helcom um, just uh, some pie graphs where the, um, the main nitrogen source is coming from. So it's, if it's a point source or a diffuse uh, load mm -hmm. and uh, atmospheric load um, deposition. And the diffusion load is often uh, kind of related also to rippling um, transport, but also um, the point source along the river. Heavy metals. So here again, um, we see that you, we have significant amounts of um, heavy metals entering the Baltic Sea. And here the pie charts again show that river arms making the, the huge input here. So the point really is we need to cut the sources uh, because eventually it is entering the Baltic Sea and it's stored into the sediment and in the river sediment and the river sediment at one point will end in the sea. Um, and this is just you know, a, a side note. Um, we have seen here the shipping line and they took samples here um, and you can see that when they are kind of in the shipping line immediately the, the heavy metal content um, concentration were increasing. So it seems to be kind of like a sink. And then you wonder, hmm, they need to kind of dig out the channel every once in a while. So what is happening with this sediment? And they're kind of also not taking it on land, but they're kind of uh, putting it somewhere in the Baltic Sea. Okay, and here um, there are some studies where um, copper, cadmium, zinc, and lead were kind of analyzed in certain um, stations along the order. And you can see that at least cadmium is kind of always exceeding uh, and passing any, any kind of um, threshold um, from what is good for, for the environment and uh, human health. When we look into the order, and take gravity cores, so only the top uh, 40 centimeters. And um, here you can see that the top part is uh, um, heavily uh, kind of 
accumulated, but also this is probably the time, the past, where it was actually uh, kind of deposited in the river. Um, so here you have almost nothing, uh, probably the reference time when industry was not uh, active. And then you have also a gradient. Here is uh, the entry of the order where you have high uh, concentrations and it kind of fades out as further you go away from the order entry. And then we just get into um, the mass accumulation rate because this is uh, all about that you kind of accumulate all the, the, um, the heavy metals and then it becomes also a problem for all the, the fauna which is going to take up the, the sediments which is uh, kind of uh, contaminated by, by the heavy metals and eventually end up on the plate of um, anyone who eats fish from the lagoon. Right, and here we have kind of the, the background content measured and flux, <coughs> and from there we actually know um, that it is a, an ongoing problem and we need to reduce once again the sources of um, the heavy metals introduced into the water. And then there are many other um, points where we sh shouldn't be blind off. I'm not taking you through today, um, but we have all the problems about microplastic transport in the rivers, POPs, so persistent organic uh, pollutants. Um, and then there comes kind of medication, and soon there comes kind of um, genes that are resistant to uh, antibiotica. They're all kind of transported into the sea, and uh, eventually they kind of all end up in human or animal biomass. Right. Another topic, next university, uh, River University. So, take home message. Um, sediments are environmental archives. So once they are stored, you can kind of uh, read the archive from top, which is modern, to the past, which is at the bottom and it's stored. So if you polluted the sediment once, it's, it's more or less that it's polluted. When you remobilize it, um, then you kind of get all the, the uh, pollution from the past back into um, nowadays modern systems. Okay, so if you wash out uh, anything from the river system, it equals to accumulating it in the sediment and green sediment. So when you uh, when you uh, listen to all the fish kills and to, uh, to the river disasters happening, you know, there's a relief always, you know, oh, fish kill, yeah, it's good, right? But then the marine biologists, they go, oh, you know, it's still ongoing because all the substances, uh, you know, they are not there in the river, but they're back in the sea. So always think about it that it's not uh, going to stop when it leaves the, the river, uh, still is in the system. So clay minerals, uh, potentially absorb heavy metals, um, and then they're not bioavailable anymore, but again, you can kind of get the clays um, in certain status that they release the heavy metals. Interestingly enough, Halcom also realized um, that rivers are important. Um, so the river runoff, uh, they, they are kind of measures uh, explicitly, and also the nutrient load um, that is brought by the river. Okay, and then you have this time lag. So here I'm repeating again, you, everything that goes in there stays there, eventually goes up into um, into the sea, and here it just takes years and decades before you get rid of a certain pollutant, um, which was in the river, but eventually will be uh, in the sea. And with this.
satisfied.